Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be with all of you in the house of the Lord this morning. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 53. Hear now the word of the Lord. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering of sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life into death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. Isaiah 53 tells us the unlikely story of a servant without majesty or power or beauty, a man familiar with suffering and intense pain. And yet it is through suffering and death that God brings life. And so as we gather in worship this morning, let us praise the God who is able to bring life from death. Let us pray. God, open our eyes and our hearts to the unlikely working of your Holy Spirit. Lord, you use those that the world does not consider worthy of even a glance. You use those that the world has despised and rejected. So God, in worship this morning, we just offer ourselves to you. We know that your Holy Spirit is at work. May you open our eyes to see your spirit, even in the most unlikely of places. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, we light the Christ candle this morning as a reminder that God's spirit is at work in the unlikely of places in a small church, in a worship service, that God's Spirit comes and dwells among us. I invite you to stand to receive the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to give the peace of Christ to one another.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who has had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
gave us some time there. I appreciate that so much, Brother Daniel, that um, I am so happy this week. This has been such a blessing for many things going on. And um, the other day I got into the Word, and I looked for songs in the Word, and I was so much more blessed with that and the lot the Lord spoke to me. So then when I went to my devotional time, the Lord says, answer the call. Answer the call. And I just thank him and praise his holy name this morning for the call that he gives to each of us. Is there anyone else who had a full word of testimony? I invite you now to take a posture of prayer. As always, the altar to my right, your left is open if you want to come and to kneel at the feet of the Lord. And Pastor Deborah will be at the altar to my left, your right. If you wish to come and to be anointed to seek a special touch from the Lord. Let us pray. generation to generation. 
Lord, help us to respond to your faithfulness and your grace. Help us to be a people who respond with faithfulness and grace in our own. A people who love as we have been loved. Who serve as we have been served. Who extend that same grace that you have extended to us, to our neighbors, and to the world around us. Lord, help us to be your faithful people. And so, Lord, we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily life. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Thank you. 
he understands. He thought he meant to repair the church he was in. So he took some of his dad's things and he destroyed them. So he repaired the church. But his dad was really, really mad. He said, you have to give back the money and say that you're not going to have my things when I pass away. You have to be poor because I don't want you to have my things anymore because you took them and stole them. So Francis said, okay. He gave back the money, and he said, I won't get your things when you die. He became poor, but he was happy. Would you be happy if you lost everything? No. No. <laughs> I wouldn't either. But he was happy because God told him, I'll take care of you. So he began preaching the word of the Lord. But not, people wouldn't always listen. So he preached to animals. Because they were saying, listen, why not preach to them? There was one time that a village was really tired of him talking about God to them. He said, go away. So he went to the river to get a drink. And he saw fish just sitting there watching him. So he's like, eh, why not? And started preaching to the fish. But the fish stayed there and listened until he said he could go. When the people went to go get a drink of water, they stopped his preaching to the fish and decided to give him another chance. There is another story where a wolf was attacking a village and he was eating people, which is really bad. And the village wanted to kill him and make him stop. But St. Francis said, wait a minute, I know a solution. He went to go talk to a wolf. Would you go talk to a wolf if he was hurting people? No. <laughs> I'd be scared. Wouldn't you? But he went to talk to the wolf and convinced the wolf not to kill people anymore. He said, Wolf, if you don't kill people anymore, this village will take care of you. And the wolf said, Okay. I'm okay with that. So he became the pet of the village. He became the village dog. <laughs> I don't understand it either. <laughs> and eventually, a lot of people came to think, oh, I really like this guy. I like what he's doing. So they joined around him. So that eventually became the Franciscan order. What do you think you can learn from St. Francis? Do you have an idea, Maria? Welcome, everybody, and I think we have worshipped this morning, haven't we? Amen. God has been with us, and I'm so thrilled that each of you are here. And I think of the generosity of this wonderful congregation, and on behalf of the board, I thank you, thank you, thank you for blessing us with your offerings, with your offering of time and, and work. And this church is a church that pitches in when need be. And 
our pitching in has spread around the world. So for our ushers, we have two of the most amazing ushers this morning, and if they would come forward, we'll receive your offer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you over and over again. And we give because you first gave. You gave us the breath that is in our lungs. You gave us the food that we eat, the people that we are blessed with. And we thank you for all the offerings that you give us. Bless this offering now. Bless both the gift and the giver. Amen. Amen. What is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We are thankful that we serve a good and gracious God, a God whose mercies are new each and every morning, the God who has been the God throughout generations, and a God who continues to sustain us by God's grace. And we are so grateful to be in the presence of this God this morning. I do want to make you aware of just a few upcoming announcements that we have in the life of St. Paul's. Uh, first of all, we want to thank everyone who has bringing, been bringing breakfast foods over the last few weeks. It has been so wonderful to be together and to share a breakfast time and fellowship with one another. Uh, thank you to Mel for bringing muffins this week. Uh, we do have some leftover muffins from last week. They are the big muffins in the clear containers. If you would like to take some of those home with you, please feel free to go into the kitchen and grab those today. We want to make sure they don't go to waste. Um, if that would be a blessing to you or to someone you know, please feel free to take those. Uh, we also have a sign-up sheet. We have, uh, we're going to be sharing Easter breakfast together. It will be a little bit different. We're going to do it potluck style. So Tim Allison has put together a sign-up sheet here on the front row. If you have not had a chance to sign up to bring something for that special breakfast time together, I invite you to do so after the service today. We will be having youth basketball from 6 to 8 p.m. this Tuesday night as well as basketball for adults, a pickup game tonight at 5 p.m. We are also collecting candy for the children's Easter egg hunt. I will have a bag out here in the foyer if you have brought any, but we're going to be uh, collecting over the next couple of Sundays so that we can put those Easter eggs together for our children. Um, if you would be willing to help prepare for our upcoming Make a Difference Day, uh, Kelly Hoagland will be up at the church this coming Friday at 9.30 a.m. So if you are able to come, I know any help would be greatly appreciated with that. And then this Saturday, uh, we are so excited, March 25th at 10 a.m. is going to be our spring planting day. Uh, we have cards here that have been made. Pastor Deborah designed these, and we are passing these out to our neighbors and our community members. We're going to take some to the apartment complex over here. We're also, we're also letting the local schools know. Uh, but we are inviting anyone who would like to participate with our spring planting. We're also going to be painting the outside of the flower beds to make them a little more attractive and, and kind of catch people's eye as they drive by. Uh, but this has a list of what we're going to be planting for our spring planting. Planting Day and also lets community members know that the produce is available to anyone who would like to come and to get some. And so if you know a neighbor or if you have someone around here that you'd like to hand out some cards to, we do have some right on the, the altar here that you can grab on your way out. You can pass out to your neighbors and friends. Uh, but we are so thankful to uh, Kelly Russ for her leadership in the uh, 
the, the planting, our community garden. And we are excited and hopeful that this will continue to be a blessing to our neighbors and continue to be a way that we can uh, get to know some people around us in our community and to share the love of Christ with them. Well, it is so good to see some familiar faces that haven't been here in a while. We want to welcome back Judy from California and Lorraine. It is so good to see you again today. We are so glad that you ladies are back. It's wonderful to be here in, your, in the presence of the Lord with you. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles if you have them this morning. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16. We are continuing our Lenten sermon series through some Old Testament text. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And the word of the Lord reads, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about me, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to do the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesus called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen and amen. How many of you like the TV show, The Price is Right? Just see a handful. Any any prices right fans out here? Oh, we've got yes. Because of the time that it was scheduled on TV, I never was able to watch it much. But during the summer breaks, I remember I loved to turn on the TV and to watch The Price Is Right. And one of my favorite games on the show was the game in which contestants would be shown a handful of products, usually three or four items, and from a simple eye test. They had to determine which product is worth more. Which product out of the group was the most valuable? And of course, if they guessed correctly, with much cheering and fanfare, because there's always much cheering and fanfare on The Price is Right, wouldn't it be great if everyone cheered for everyone the way they cheer for everyone on The Price is Right? <laughs> but to much cheering and fanfare, the contestant would get to take home the items displayed 
have a chance to spin the wheel to go to the final showcase. It was awesome. I think I liked it because it was the only one I was good at. If I had to guess specific numbers, I had no chance. But if I had, you know, 50-50 shot, it was usually okay. Now, while this type of comparison game is fun on a game show, such value systems can often become troubling when applied in real life. It doesn't take us long to realize that there are very clearly delineated value systems at work in our world. Value systems that regularly hold up multiple people or people groups or belief systems and ask us to do a simple eye test and to answer that same question that was asked on the game show. Which of these is worth more? Which of these is most valuable? And we are taught from an early age that one's value often comes from what we can see or observe with our two eyes. We humans have been shaped and formed to make value judgments based on outward appearance, to give value based on how attractive a person is, or by the color of a person's skin or their gender, by the way they speak or their physical ability by where they are from, or how successful they appear to be in the eyes of others. And unfortunately, there are far too many times when people are written off, not given a fair chance, disregarded and considered less valuable, simply because they do not measure up to the value systems that our world has long employed. Because when that question is asked, which is worth more? What has the most value? Often, for superficial reasons, they find themselves with the short end of the stick. In our text this morning, we see a very similar value system at work. In David's day, much like it still is today, there was a clear pecking order at play. Older sons over younger sons. The free over the slave. Men over women, the rich over the poor, the powerful over the weak, Israel first over foreigners. And there was a clear hierarchy in society at play, a value system that was ingrained in people at an early age, teaching them that some people inherently have more value than others. And it appears here that even Samuel, the great religious leader of Israel, is not immune to the pull of such value systems. Our text begins with God calling Samuel to travel to Bethlehem with the purpose of anointing God's selection for the next king of Israel, a son from the household of Jesse. It is a dangerous sort of mission. The kind that could have serious implications if King Saul, who is very much still in power at this point, were to catch wind that Samuel is going behind his back and anointing a future king. But Samuel, in obedience to God, takes the risk and goes. And as he arrives in Bethlehem, he assures the elders there that, are, that, that his surprised presence because, after all, it's not every day that someone of Samuel's stature shows up in your town. And he assures them that he has come in peace, and he makes plans for a sacrifice, inviting Jesse and his sons to it, just as he has been instructed by the Lord to do. And after everyone has arrived, Samuel looks around at those gathered at the sacrifice, and he sees each of Jesse's oldest sons pass before him. First, he sees Eliab, Jesse's oldest son. And the text tells us that Samuel is immediately impressed by his appearance, thinking, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. It makes sense to Samuel that the oldest son would be the obvious choice. He is tall and handsome, characteristics that people look, like, look for in a kingly figure. As the eldest, he is the one who will one day inherit all that his father owns, the one who has been groomed from the earliest of ages to take over the family business. The oldest brother, Eliab, seems to be the obvious <coughs> choice. But the Lord, knowing Samuel's heart, knowing his pre 
propensity to be drawn into seeing a person's worth through the value systems of this world, instructs Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Amen. And so Jesse calls his next son, Abinadab, and has him pass in front of Samuel. But the Lord, again, is clear. The Lord has not chosen this one either. And so the process continues. Jesse then has Shema pass by. But the Lord has not chosen this son either. Son after son, seven in all, passed in front of Samuel, who has traveled all this way to anoint a king from Jesse's household. But each time the message of the Lord is clear. None of these sons are the one whom the Lord has chosen. I can imagine at this point that Samuel is at a little bit of a loss. Here they are. These are the seven sons. There are no more sons present here at the sacrifice. What is going on? Has he come all this way, risking the ire of King Saul to leave empty-handed? So Samuel asks Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? And Jesse responds, well, there is still the youngest. He is out tending sheep. So Samuel instructs him, send for him. We will not sit until he arrives. And so it is the youngest son, David, a boy from the field, probably still smelling a little bit like his furry companions, who passes in front of Samuel. And this time, the Lord says, rise and anoint him. This is the one. The Lord does not look at what people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David, in many ways, is an unlikely choice for king. According to the value systems of the world, David doesn't seem to measure up. If the question had been asked, which has more value, David or his older brothers, David would have been the clear underdog. Even in his father's eyes, he seems to be an afterthought, not even seen as worthy enough to be asked to come in from the fields. And by all appearances, it seems that Samuel, too, was immediately taken with the potential of David's older brothers. They were older, stronger, more powerful. But in all appearances, based on the eye test, any one of these older brothers would have been the better choice. And Samuel, knowing the pecking order of our world, immediately jumps to the conclusion that God, too, must see the value in these older brothers and choose one of them for such an important calling. But we quickly learn here in this text that God does not operate by the value systems of our world. Amen. God does not see people in the way that we do. God does not consider one's value based on appearance or birth status or resume. Much to Samuel's surprise, God does not choose one of the more likely candidates, one of the handsome older seven brothers, but instead God chooses David, a handsome boy, but a boy nonetheless, the baby of the family, the one who was not even considered to be invited in from the field. And yet it is this young, overlooked boy that God chooses and calls. God sees the value in David that Samuel and Jesse and the others gathered their midst because they were busy evaluating one's worth based on worldly standards. They were looking for a king with power with a kingly outer appearance, with a status in the family and community that would be seen as respectable. But God looks carefully past the exterior, past the surface image, and sees the heart. In the choosing of David, God acts in surprising and mysterious ways that make no sense according to the value systems of our world, but that makes perfect sense in the kingdom of God. Amen. If we look at 
the history of the call of God upon people's lives, this is hardly the only time that God has chosen and called an unlikely candidate. Time and time again, God acts in mysterious ways. Time and time again, God moves outside of humanity's carefully crafted value systems, beyond our dividing lines and our labels and our superficial judgments, and God surprises us with whom God chooses to use for God's glory. I think of Gideon, the weakest member from the weakest clan, a man filled with doubt, and yet someone God uses to deliver God's people out of the hands of Midian. I think of the female judge, Deborah, a woman living in a man's world who was called and used by God to lead God's people to victory against the Canaanites. I think of Esther, a Jewish woman who becomes queen, chosen by God for such a time as this. I think of Mary, a young peasant virgin chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. I think about the Samaritan woman, the subject of community gossip, whose encounter with Jesus and subsequent testimony leads to the salvation of many in her village. I think of Simon, a lowly fisherman, who was called by Jesus and renamed Peter, for this would be the rock on which Christ would build his church. I think of the women who went to the tomb on the third day, those who were considered unreliable witnesses in their culture, who became the first evangelist of the resurrected Christ. But most of all, I think of Jesus, the one who is God in human flesh, a descendant of David, of whom is written about in Isaiah 53, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by humankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low self-esteem. He was an unlikely messiah. One with no sword or white horse, one with no war cry or army, one with no earthly power or even a place to lay his head. A Messiah who was gentle and humble, one who took the position of a servant, one who was killed by rather than victorious over his enemies. A Messiah who was written off abandoned, disregarded, stripped of having any value in the eyes of the world. And yet it is this very Messiah that we as humanity so desperately needed, though we did not have the eyes to see it. It was this Messiah through whom on the cross God displays God's power once and for all. It was on the cross that Christ was enthroned and glorified. It was on the cross, a symbol of failure, according to our world, where sin and death were defeated once and for all. In the most unlikely Messiah, through the most unlikely of means, God works in a surprising way that forever upends and transforms the value systems of our world. Amen. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. Friends, God continues to work in the same faithful, countercultural ways today as God did then. We are so often like Samuel. We have good intentions. We desire to follow God's will. And yet we often find that our vision is still captivated by the value systems of our world. We still, like Samuel, expect God to choose the likely candidate, to call people according to the pecking order of our world. We still expect for God to work in ways that make sense to us. And church, because of that, there are too many times when we become blind to what God is desiring to do in 
us and in others in our midst. Too often, even today, we miss out on what God is desiring to do in and among us because we are caught up in looking for God to work in ways that we expect through people that we expect. The church, God invites us, particularly in this Lenten season, to have a sanctified vision. And what I mean by that is that God invites us to see ourselves and those around us through God's eyes and not through the lens of the value systems of our world. Amen. God invites us not just to act on our own expectations or superficial judgments, but like Samuel, to listen for the voice of God and to allow God's voice to surprise us. To allow God the freedom in our lives and in the lives of others to work in the ways that God has planned and not just in the ways that we've come to expect. So I have a couple of really important questions for us this morning. Is there space in our lives? Is there space in our plans? Is there space in our theology and our understanding of God for God to surprise us, for God to correct us, for God to teach us something new, or do we have God all figured out? Like Samuel, are we really listening to God? Not just listening for God to confirm to us what we think we already know, but really listening in such a way that we can hear and respond to God's voice even when God says something we don't expect. Amen. Church, I wonder how God might be desiring to surprise us this morning if we could hear from the voice of God. Who might God be calling this morning if we quit viewing ourselves and others through the lens of comparisons, who might be leading a ministry a year from now that we would never expect in this moment? Who might be sitting in these pews who is not here right now? Where might God call us if we allow ourselves to be fully surrendered to him, how might we be used for God's glory? Amen. Gladys Aylward, a British woman, heard the call of God to missions in China one night sitting in an evening service at her local church in the early 1930s. However, despite her excitement in answering God's call, she quickly learned that she was an unlikely candidate, considered an unlikely candidate by the church. You see, she was born just north of London to a poor working class family, a family who found themselves at the very bottom of the social chain, living on the wrong side of the tracks. And so when she applied to be a missionary, she was quickly denied for she had dropped out of school at 14 to work as a housemaid to help support her family. According to the committee, she was too poor, too female, too single, and too uneducated. But despite this setback, Gladys refused to give up on her calling. After requesting official missionary status from the church year after year, the committee finally gave in and said that she could go, but told her that she would have to pay her own way, find her own transportation, and could go with the understanding that she would be fully responsible for herself once she arrived. And so after working for several more years to raise up the money to be able to go, she got on a train and traveled to China alone through war-torn areas where she encountered another single female Christian woman whom she trained under for several months and joined in starting an inn for wayward travelers. Unfortunately, her friend tragically died just a few short years later. But even then, Gladys 
refused to give up on her calling. And God was faithful. God gave Gladys countless opportunities to be involved in the community and to interact with people and to share the good news of Christ. And she found that because she was female, community members actually found her less threatening and were more open with her. One over time, even the city leaders recognized something different in her, and Gladys was given a Chinese name in the community, meaning the virtuous one. The inn that she started with her friend over time expanded to become an orphanage. And she cared for over 100 children there. And when the Japanese threatened to invade China in World War II, it was she who led that 100 children over the mountains to safety. Gladys continued to preach the message of Christ all her life until she died in 1970. Friends, the God who called Gladys continues to call surprising people to surprising places for surprising reasons. I wonder what God might be calling you to today. Or who might God be calling you to be a Samuel to? One who dares to see the call of God in another person and encourages them along the way. Church, my prayer for us is that that God may continue to help us see ourselves and to see those around us in the way that God sees us. And that when God calls, we might be obedient, even when it surprises us along the way. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful that you are a God who continues to call your people. We are thankful that you are a God who continues to step outside of our carefully crafted value systems and shows us a different, better way. Where our value and worth does not come in comparison to others or how much we have or the way we were made, but instead our value comes from you alone. Give us eyes to see ourselves the way you see us. Give us eyes to see the way, to see others around us the way that you see them. Help us to be a people who take off the broken lenses of our world and who truly begin to see people through the eyes of grace, through the power of the Spirit, through the possibility of transformation. Help us not to be a people who just look at the superficial outer image and make snap judgments about people, but instead help us to see them as they can be by your grace, just as others and you once saw us by your grace. God, you continue to call each and every one of us, and I pray that we would be receptive to your call this morning. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Open our eyes to new possibilities. Expand our imaginations. May we not be a people who have you all figured out, but instead are led by a spirit that continues to surprise us. You are a good and a gracious God, and we surrender our futures fully into your hands. And we will be careful to give you all praise and glory and honor for what you do through us, in us, and in those around us. We ask these things in the mighty name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. There is no better place to see a different value system at work than here at the table. whereby the cross, which was considered a failure by the world, is turned into the ultimate victory of love. A place where we are invited to come, not saying which has more valuable and only those who are most valuable can come, but rather anyone who recognizes their deep need for Jesus. 
Anyone who is willing to surrender their lives and say, Jesus, I am yours. I need what you alone can provide. This table does not weigh us out. But at this table, Jesus, as our host, says, come just as you are. My grace is sufficient for even you. And we say thanks be to God for that. Christ, our Lord, invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live at peace with one another. Therefore, as we prepare our hearts, knowing that it is our hearts that God looks at, let us prepare them this morning to come to the table by praying together the prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we might delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Church, I invite you to hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, proving God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. We remember at this table that on the night our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had broken it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. In the same way, after the meal, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my cup of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we finally feast his heavenly baby. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. As you feel your hearts are prepared, I'm going to invite you to come this morning. We'll come towards center aisle. We'll come with open hands to receive the gifts that God has for us. And then we will take the elements and go back to our seats where we will receive them together. Church, these gifts are for all. The grace of God is sufficient at this table. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. <coughs>
pull out, pull back the first layer to reveal the bread. Church, this is the body of Christ, which has been broken for you. Eat in remembrance of his holy sacrifice. I invite you to pull back the next layer to reveal the juice. Church, this is the blood of Christ, which has been shed for you. Drink in remembrance of his holy sacrifice. Together, as the people of God, we say, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the power of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. As Pastor Levi comes to bring us this morning's benediction, if you have sensed the call of God on your life this morning in a particular way, I would invite you to tell someone about that. Invite them to be praying for you about that. Uh, Pastor Levi or I or any of the pastoral staff would love to hear from you. But even if you're sharing it with one another, have someone that's specifically praying for you. And we will rejoice in what God is doing and how God is continuing to call God's people. Church, stand this morning for this benediction. May the God who does not look on the outside but looks at our heart, find that it is a heart that is bent towards people, that God would take us as we are and shape us and mold us into his likeness and then blow us out into the world as signs of God's own presence in the world. Let us go singing God's praise together. Praise God.